Hi everyone, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Tomer from uh, Nokia Cloudband Business Unit. I'm here with uh, my friend, my colleague Renat. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, uh, orchestrating end-to-end -end network service uh, using uh, heavily using Mistral, but we're talking about uh, the process of uh, network service service chaining uh, and. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, show you about, we'll show you a bit uh, of the CBND, our network uh, service orchestrator. Uh, so uh, Renat will uh, start with like uh, around 15 minutes uh, about uh, Mistral specifically, and I'll continue uh, with uh, CBND. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, hello, everybody, again. Um, so, uh, before I get started, actually, with some details, I probably, uh, some of you already heard about Mistral, some of them, some of you actually attended my previous presentation, at, uh, presentations at, like, previous summits, and uh, a lot of things actually may uh, sound familiar to you, but, like, um, I was asking myself today, what else am I going to tell about uh, at this presentation? Actually, I've been asking about it myself, uh, like, during, like, the last week, probably. And the thing is, you know, uh, here's the opportunity again to talk about Mistral. And uh, uh, I just decided to, uh, like, if emphasize the most important uh, things related to Mistral, probably. Uh, so, and discuss, like, the importance of certain things from a little bit different angle. So, because, like, as we go, as we keep developing Mistral, um, uh, we understand that, uh, like some of the things are not so important that we th thought it were. Uh, there were uh, some of them. They are uh, more uh, like more important, and um, like we have some vision, and uh, it keeps changing. So I'm, I'm, I'll try to actually talk about it from a little bit different perspective. Um, like big picture, uh, what is Mistral? So uh, first of all. It's a language, essentially, for writing workflows. Uh, like, um, uh, workflow is a kind of a general term, but uh, what specifically we call workflow is um, a distributed process, essentially, that you need to automate. And this is like a purely technical term, probably, but it describes uh, what it is, I think, best. Uh, it's an open stack service with the REST API, of course. Uh, you can scale it, so it scales pretty uh, well, like almost like linearly. And um, it's easy to build any kind of driven automation uh, pipelines and allows you to actually inject arbitrary code snippets into, into the workflow, into the scenario that you want to like reproduce, uh, you want to design. Um, that, that's like a really big picture. So it's like an automation tool that allows you to write something um, in a YAML-based language. It allows you to upload it to uh, this service, and service runs it um, in a scalable, highly available uh, manner. And here's like the big picture about uh, Mistral. Um, let's like consider like a example that I like very much. So uh, many people, uh, I heard from many people that uh, this is kind of an abstract example, it has nothing to do with uh, like what we do in OpenStack, but I like it really much just because I think it illustrates uh, the problem of automation pretty well. Uh, just because it's easy to understand that what kind of scale uh, requires automation. And I find it actually pretty easy to explain to people from telcos what workflows are for. And it, I find it sometimes difficult to explain uh, what workflow is for people who are not from telcos. So, but everybody knows basically what parallel computing is. is um, uh, everybody probably heard about uh, frameworks like Hadoop, some other uh, high uh, computing frameworks. Um, basically, if we need to, if we have some like large uh, amount of data, for example, uh, produced uh, somewhere in CERN, right? And we need to process that data somehow. Uh, usually like the typical approach uh, nowadays, uh, we need to parallelize it somehow. The whole computer, like huge computation. So for that, 
what we typically need to do, we, we can't use any like uh, single server, even if it's re really, really powerful, just because it would take like many, many years to complete the task. Um, what usually uh, people do, they try to par parallelize, they try to actually acquire um, uh, some computational resources temporarily just for this task to complete and then release those resources. So, and uh, it all comes to using clouds actually. So uh, more specifically what we would do here is we would basically allocate a number of uh, virtual machines, configure them s somehow, uh, then uh, once they're all configured, we could actually split the whole computation into multiple uh, small, relatively small pieces. And uh, each of those uh, virtual machines would do something useful and then we would aggregate um, those like small results. And finally, we would uh, get our final result, like aggregation. So after that, we may want to like build a report on top of uh, what we've done, right? And essentially, we could notify someone, uh, somehow some uh, human that's, uh, that the whole process is actually completed. So by the way, uh, some of the things can be done uh, by other tools. It's not, it doesn't have to be actually Mistral. Uh, that's why you can see it can be done by heat, which is uh, totally true. What I'm trying to say here, you, even if you use heat, uh, or something else to like simplify parts of this uh, whole like huge process, which can take actually days, m even weeks and months, uh, you still need to think about what's gonna happen if you, for example, uh, a process like this is uh, going on for like um, a week and something is broken at some point. Imagine if you were trying to do something like that just by writing uh, Python uh, code, right? So if something gets broken, you never know uh, what's left. Like you have to uh, like uh, look at the tons of log files and uh, not always they uh, contain all the information that you need. And this is kind of a challenge uh, that we have in this case. And the value of workflow in this case actually exactly by uh, in representing the whole process as the workflow, uh, which is kind of a uh, graph of uh, states that we can have. Uh, it's a graph of task essentially. Every task can, has a state, that, that's why I said uh, graph of states essentially. So uh, what we would do here actually, we would represent the whole thing as a workflow here and uh, we would make it, uh, as I call it, stateful essentially. And this makes a really, really big difference comparing to uh, some other auto automation tools um, that we have in the market. And um, actually, uh, state is a key thing here. So what would uh, happen here is, for example, like uh, uh, you see like uh, these lines here and uh, like my virtual machines like from number two to number 50 are totally configured, it's all fine, but in one of the workflow branches we had a failure. And essentially what workflow allows you to do is it allows you to start from the same point when you fix the problem manually. So you don't have to uh, start the whole process uh, again because it's just too expensive. And that's like uh, the value of the workflow. Specifically, uh, it's all YAML. When you uh, start writing your workflows, it's YAML. And uh, this is just a quick example of uh, like a real uh, working workflow, actually. Um, uh, I'm not gonna like talk um, too much about the language itself because it's, um, well, well, whereas it's uh, pretty simple, uh, the discussion about the language is the whole st different story. Actually, it's a, it would take like another hour or so uh, just talking about the language itself. Even though I believe, you know, it's pretty easy to consume it, to learn it, it would take probably like a half a day to uh, learn all the features that we have. And by the way, uh, simplicity, uh, simplicity, conciseness of the language was uh, one of the goals that we uh, had in mind uh, when we started working on Mistral. So, and um, yeah, like I said before, uh, just to summarize again what I said, uh, State, state is a key thing here uh, when it comes to 
uh, describing what workflow is. It makes a huge, huge difference because, like, uh, one of our contributors actually on the previous session said that, you know, uh, when you're writing a workflow, it's really not easy, uh, just to be honest. Uh, it's much, much easier to write a Python script or whatever else script because uh, a lot of people uh, can do it really well. They have a lot of skills. So, like, from designing perspective, it's much, much easier to use, like, a general purpose language, essentially. But from operational standpoint, when you when you're dealing with those scripts in Python and Bash, something else, uh, uh, when, so, when something is broken, you're uh, left with a mess, essentially. You have to uh, understand what exactly is configured, what is not, actually. And uh, key is, uh, uh, the key thing here is state, exactly. So, um, and uh, st uh, state actually also enables uh, asynchronous processing and, uh, like I said, effective error handling, which I also uh, mentioned. So uh, some other reasons uh, to use workflows. Uh, workflows, because of the state again, they're scalable. So essentially, uh, everything is um, uh, stored in some storage, in a persistent storage, and even if one of the nodes of the uh, uh, Mistral workflow cluster actually uh, crashes, everything keeps working. So uh, losing a Mistral node doesn't lead to losing uh, a workflow, so, uh, which is also really important and that's like uh, totally different from uh, running just a Python uh, code. Um, like getting back to my previous uh, picture with uh, running workflow like multiple branches as parallel, so workflow uh, technology allows you to do things in parallel and you don't have to actually worry about um, any like parallelism yourself and uh, uh, workflow technologies this allows you to do it pretty naturally and um, it allows you to actually synchronize your multiple like computational branches pretty easily too uh, it has some certain entities in the workflow language so uh, like this was kind of a quick introduction into what Mistral is I think it's uh, enough for now so um, I just want to mention uh, a few things that we achieved in Newton cycle. I think it's, uh, it might be interesting for those who have been following Mistral like, uh, quite well. Uh, so the major achievement that we made uh, in Newton cycle uh, is performance and stability. So it's now kind of a couple of orders of magnitude faster than it was uh, like four or five months ago. And we've done like a number of things to make it happen just because for our use cases and Tomer is going to tell about it more, like it's really critically important how uh, f um, the performance actually, how reliable it is and how fast it is. Uh, so some other things that we've done and it's, um, it was also uh, requested like a long time ago is uh, multi-vim support, uh, thanks to our Hungarian team. And um, so essentially what you can do now, uh, you can have uh, just one Mistral installation and it can work with multi, uh, multiple clouds uh, at the same time. So what's actually missing right now, to be honest, is you can't have workflows uh, that involve like multiple uh, clouds within one workflow, but you can run uh, one workflow on this cloud and another one on that cloud uh, without like reconfiguring Mistral um, at all. And it's like critically important too for uh, some of the use cases that we have at Nokia. So uh, we also have now integration with uh, key clock authentication server. So uh, instead of Keystone, we can use key clock. And uh, now we can use Jinja 2 as an expression language for those who don't like YAKL or like can't use YAKL for some reason. Jinja is like a, a known expression language and you can use it. Um, yeah, like I said, multi-vim support is uh, like one of, well, was one of the critically important uh, features that we uh, needed to add actually into Mistral, so um, it's kind of a small illustration for that. Um, as far as what we're gonna do next, um, like around Mistral development, what we are really missing, I believe, is uh, some kind of visualization of the whole uh, framework, so um, primarily, 
uh, people are interested in seeing some visualization for how the uh, process is actually running. So if you started something and it takes long to complete, like days, uh, it would be really, really cool to see uh, it visually so that you see what's completed, what's not, what's still uh, uh, in the plan and stuff like that. Uh, so we also want to make a lot of you know, usability improvements and we're now designing like new version API and um, uh, common light interface, but uh, um, like don't mix them uh, with uh, language itself. So language is kind of stable, so we're not gonna do any like non-backwards uh, compatible uh, changes. Um, and we also need to improve scaling because right now it works so like really fast with uh, OneNote, but we have some uh, limitations when it goes to using like multiple uh, engine nodes. Um, that's pretty much it, I think, uh, in this part. And uh, here's like a list of uh, like achievements in terms of, you know, uh, who uses Mistral in, in something real. So uh, you can see a list of uh, like usages, uh, real usages, and uh, this is like a very small uh, part of the whole list that we uh, have in mind actually, but those are like general uh, use cases that uh, we're kind of proud of. So I think this part is over, so I can hand it to Tomer. Yeah. Thank you, Renat. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about uh, CBND, our uh, NFV orchestrator. Uh, what we see here is uh, the Etsy NFV Mano architecture. So basically, uh, on the top, you can see the NFV orchestrator. Uh, this is what we are doing, actually. And uh, NFV orchestrator talk to mainly with the v VFA manager. Uh, uh, that's that's the, actual, the, the, uh, the actual manager that manages a specific VNF. It needs to talk to the Vim itself, mainly for uh, networking purposes. Uh, it has a network service catalog. And uh, of course, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an orchestrator. It can orchestrate the whole network service. Uh, so in CloudBand, we have uh, mainly three products uh, according to this architecture. So uh, the product that I'm working on is the NFVO, uh, which actually automates all the operation uh, related to uh, a distributed multi-tenant, multi-vendor uh, network service. Uh, we have the CBAM, which is CloudBand Application Manager. That's the VNFMs. And we have the infrastructure, which, which is uh, CBIS. Uh, that's uh, actually the Vim based on a Red Hat distribution with uh, additions. Uh, but the NVO itself is not limited to CBIS itself. It can work over any, any infrastructure, any Vim, uh, not necessarily OpenStack, and it, it can talk to any uh, VNF manager uh, in the market. Uh, so basically, the end-to-end -end, uh, service delivery start uh, usually with uh, con con some kind of uh, business service, uh, OSS, BSS system, that's a uh, uh, start or deployment of uh, network service. Then it's go to our orchestrator, uh, CBND. Uh, it starts to uh, actually deploy the network service. Uh, CBND uh, talk to the VNFM. Uh, each VNF can be managed by a different VNFM and can reside on a different Vim, on a different uh, uh, geo geography. Uh, so the VNF, uh, NFVO talks to the VNFMs and start the deployment for each VN VNF. Also, the uh, NFVO is taking care of all the component of the network service, which are not uh, VNFs, which can be uh, physical network functions, uh, usually at the edges of the network service. And uh, everything that needed for the ne network service, we'll see that uh, in a minute, uh, all the forwarding path, uh, virtual link, etc. Okay. So uh, the, the NFVO is, uh, again, it says a network service catalog. It, it automates uh, the management of network service. Uh, our design is uh, that everything is pluggable. So SDN is uh, one kind of plugin. Right now we're working with Nuage. Uh, OpenStack is a plugin. Uh, uh, 
and uh, VNFM is a plugin. So if you want to integrate a different uh, VNFM or if you want to, to work with a different Vim, that's, that's possible. Uh, it's responsible for all the lifecycle of the network service, uh, deploy, scale, etc. cetera. Uh, whatever you need to do with the forwarding pass, that's the pass between the network, uh, between the v VNFs themselves. Uh, again, multi-geographies and uh, multi-VIM support. Uh, so this is how uh, network service look like. So basically we have the VNFs. Usually on the, on the edges you will see PNFs also, which is physical network services. So here we have uh, uh, three VNFs. Uh, and uh, on, on, uh, each, even on each VNF, there will be one connection point, uh, at least. Uh, the most simple way of connection point is uh, actually a VNIC. And there are virtual link, which are the logical connection between the VNFs. And there is the uh, forwarding, forwarding graph, uh, which is actually a definition of the traffic flow between the different VNFs. Uh, Forwarding graph can be based on, uh, let's say, on the port. So if you have, uh, let's say, port 80, you want to uh, route the traffic through a, a load balancer or firewall. And uh, if this is a, a spam filter, then probably the port will be different. And uh, also it can be based on a business uh, policy, like uh, what the customer paid for and uh, what services uh, were purchased. So the terminology, uh, Tosca, I believe uh, some of you are familiar with that. Uh, Tosca is a topology and, uh, topology and specification for cloud uh, application. Uh, it's built in, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, written in, in YAML. Uh, NSD is uh, some kind of, it's a network service descriptor and uh, basically it's a Tosca template. Uh, packed in uh, some kind of, uh, it's called CSR Cloud Service Archive. So it's basically the, the template itself with some kind of uh, descriptor. Uh, so what we do in a cloud -based network uh, director, what's our flow? So basically we start with a Tosca template. Uh, we know how to parse the to Tosca template. We know how to process. We know how to, uh, actually we have a very complicated uh, parser. We know, uh, we understand all the relationship, the interesting function. We do a lot of validation on that. Uh, once the Tosca template is, uh, is parsed and done, when uh, someone starts to deploy a network service, then we build uh, something called an operation execution graph. Uh, this is a graph that's based on the Tosca, Tosca interfaces and the operation inside the Tosca interfaces. I'll show you a few examples in a minute. And uh, probably the most important thing is the Mistral workflow, which is actually uh, we generate code, we generate uh, Mistral workflow, and from that point, from the point that the workflow are ready, we just let Mistral do everything, so, including our own housekeeping, like cre creating jobs in the system, updating the status. Uh, so Mistral is taking end-to-end -end responsibility for, for the, the full uh, network service deployment. Okay. So now we're going to uh, talk a bit about Tosca. What's important in Tosca, I'll try to do it quick. Uh, so in Tosca, we have uh, node types. Probably the most important thing are node, tump, node types and relationship types. And uh, the instantiation of node type and relationship type are actually uh, node template and relationship. So for example, node type can be, can be Tosca node compute, and the, the to node template is actual compute you want to boot. Uh, with the name, whatever, compute one. Uh, so just, just a simple visualization. Uh, each, one of, each one here is a node template. Uh, you can see three node templates here. Uh, I took it from the, from the Tosca document, so there are uh, three node templates here. Uh, you can see that each one has properties. Uh, on the bottom you'll see a server, and uh, then on top there is a, like a database, which is Hosted, hosted on a container, and then uh, the container will be a compute. So all the right side, these uh, orange uh, arrows are actually a requirement or relationship. This is the same thing. Uh, the green thing is what's, what's called in Tosca interfaces, and that's the actual operation that's happening when you do. You can run a script. In our case, we're running a workflow, but this is the actual uh, executable. So uh, in relationship, 
we'll talk about it in a minute, but there is a, like a relationship that's derived from depends on and the ones that are not derived from depend on, and then you have to uh, compose your graph a bit, a bit differently. Okay, so CSR, like I said, it's a zip archive uh, that packages the NSD. Uh, we have a JSON manifest file uh, that's actually point to, you could see the artifact name, uh, main YAML. This is the, the network service itself. Uh, we can have more than one network service in a CSR. And uh, CBND itself uh, do a versioning of the CSR. So uh, you, if you go to like our application catalog, I'll show you an, uh, an example. So we have an application catalog here, and you can see that, for example, uh, for this uh, specific uh, network service, there, there were three versions. Uh, you can download the NSD, upload new one, updates, uh, whatever you want. Uh, so that's for the CSR. So if we're talking about Tosca interfaces, so basically what's important is that uh, for each node type there is interface called standard, for each relationship there is interface called configure. So when we're talking about deploy for each uh, node type, there is a three operation, uh, create, configure, start, the one on the left, most left and right. And each relationship between them, them create another uh, seven operations that can be implemented or empty. Uh, that's the standard interf interface uh, in central normative operation that Tosca, Tosca nodes may, may support. Uh, I must say here that probably most of the, not most, but part of the operation are not all, always implemented. So if you want to create uh, something, let's say I want to create a database, so maybe the create will be with some kind of script or workflow. The configure sometimes may be empty. Uh, and, and the configure itself, which is an uh, interface on the relationship, give you another uh, set of operation. So this operation can uh, cover deploy and undeploy. So just a small example. This is something uh, with the execution graph that we generate. Uh, there are uh, three nodes here, and uh, with uh, depends on uh, relationship between them, and. Uh, we take this and we take all the operations from, from, uh, from the nodes themselves when we build some kind of execution graph. So this execution graph is actually, you can see there is a, a firewall, an anti-DDoS VNFs, and what we are doing in each operation. So we start uh, with creating them in parallel. Uh, these two, uh, two anti-DDoS and anti-spam, uh, sorry, and the firewall has no dependency between them, so they can go separately without any dependencies. Uh, the other one, the anti-spam, uh, depends on the firewalls, so they need to, to, to be executed one after the other. So this is one example. Uh, this is a different example when there is no dependency, so things can be done in uh, a better degree of uh, parallelism between them. Uh, so that's, that's our execution graph. I want to show you something uh, like a typical net network service can generate a, a graph uh, in a size of this. So the graph have a lot of nodes. After we generate that, we have, we're doing some other process to remove all the empty ones, but uh, it's quite heavy graph. And you can, you can think that if, if uh, you've created your own node types or if you've implemented all the, all the um, interfaces, all the, interf all the operation in the interface, then uh, Mistral gonna work really hard. Uh, so, so show you uh, another thing is uh, a bit. Um, a, uh, this is network service. How network service uh, look in our system? This is the network service part of the CSR not the manifest, the network service itself. So uh, basically you will see here the VNF themselves, input parameters. Uh, the VNFs themselves, you see here you have a gate VNF. PNFs are uh, physical uh, network function that we need to uh, usually configure as part of uh, deploying the network service. 
uh, and other VNFs, and you can see also uh, all the forwarding, forwarding passes here. Um, that's, that's the order of how the traffic goes between the VNFs themselves. And there is the policy which actually defined uh, like port 22 or port 80 or something like that, like the traffic flows based on the, based on the port. And then uh, we deploy everything. Uh, show you an example of uh, this is a deployed network service. This is a demo. Uh, this is uh, like our demo environment from the booth downstairs. So, uh, for example, uh, this is a network service. You can see that we had uh, we have two v uh, PNFs here, uh, first and the third, and we have uh, two VNFs here. Uh, we can see the forwarding path here. This is a uh, the traffic flow, everything is, is running. This is all defined in a new SDN. Uh, topology, this is uh, the vitrage graph of our, uh, our network service. So basically, you can see that there is a network service here. And we have the VNFs. Uh, in this example, we are using Morano as our VNFM. So it's Morano overheat. We talk directly to uh, Morano. Uh, not the CBAM, and uh, Nuage is playing also here uh, a major part. Uh, that's it, PNFs. If something, this is a vitrage graph, so if something goes wrong, uh, you will uh, immediately see it on, on this graph. Uh, except for that, we have the output of the process. Here, there's not much output, but we uh, expose everything from the Mistral workflow. Uh, back to the CBND, and also we sometimes expose uh, things from the VNF themselves, like outputs of the heat templates. Uh, we have the, the plugins here that manage all the resources. Uh, we have the Vim, uh, which we can see uh, status of the Vim. And uh, we have the VNFMs, SDN controllers. Uh, I'm almost done. I just want to show you another two things. Uh, this is the generated workflow that we, we, we generate in during the process. So we can see it's not, uh, well, it's readable, but it's uh, auto-generated. So basically, we, can, we generate uh, pretty heavy, heavy workflows. Um, some of them are doing, like I told you, some kind of uh, housekeeping, updating the model in our, in our uh, uh, let's say, database or servers. Uh, some of them uh, talking to plugin layer that's talked to an SDN. Uh, some of them talking to the plugin layer that's talked to the VNFM. Uh, so basically, they are pretty heavy. Uh, like Renat said, we are looking for a way to visualize the execution and uh, monitoring somehow uh, what's what's going on with a, with a workflow execution. So we are working on um, something called Cloudflow. Uh, this is something we plan to contribute soon. So basically, this is a, uh, it will imp improve, I'm sure, but this is something, this is just a preview. This is something that uh, actually shows uh, the different Mistral tasks and what's happened. Uh, uh, the, the green uh, arrows are the on success between different tasks, and the red is uh, on failure. So it just shows you what's happened between the tasks. If tasks succeed, it, then it's continuing the chain. You can see also here uh, there are some uh, joins uh, and forks, I think, here or not. I'm not sure. Uh, that's it. Just want to show you, like, uh, this is. Uh, Mistral uh, workflow list. Sorry. So if, if we look at Mistral workflow list in one of our test machine, uh, so basically we have, uh, let's say, the top, top 10 or 12 of us, what we call built-in workflow. So we have like a set of workflow that we actually ship with the product, uh, which is to create, a, to create a, a network resource, to create a VNF, to delete a VNF. And then all this bunch of uh, workflow after that is the, the generated one. And there is no problem if you want to upload your own workflow to the, as part of the CSR upload. You can upload your own workflow. Let's say you have a new router that you want to configure, and you can supply Mistral workflow for that. Then you can do that. 
uh, a typical uh, network service uh, deployment generates a lot, a lot of load on Mistral. So like uh, Renat said, we did, we did a lot of uh, performance imp improvement on that. Um, uh, that's it. I'll finish here. I'll give uh, five minutes for question if someone has any. Yeah, uh, I have a question uh, regarding uh, support of the multiple infrastructure managers, multi yes. VMs in Mistral. So uh, deployment wise, uh, do you have to install Mistral on each VM? Or it's sufficient to have it installed on, let's say, let's say, master region, and then it will talk to the the other regions. The question is about Mistral itself. Uh, the, you're right; it's Mistral, yes. not the CBND, the multi vim. If we need the Mistral on each of the vims. Uh, so, like I said before, uh, there is some support right now for multi vims. Uh, it basically allows you to have one Mistral instance. At, sorry. Um, uh, yeah, one Mistral instance, and you can actually work with uh, multiple VIMs. But the only limitation is uh, when your workflow is running, it cannot include like calls to different VIMs uh, within the same workflow. Within. Okay, uh, and where does Mistral get information about the multiple VIMs? Is it uh, parsing uh, um, regions in uh, so, Keystone? Uh, well, uh, this is up to the uh, uh, system that uh, actually calls Mistral. So. Uh, when you need some, uh, to run something on a certain Vim, you have to provide a, a number of parameters right. so that Mistral uh, knows where to connect their OpenStack actions to. Okay, so when, basically uh, if you supply the dash dash OS region uh, parameter to your uh, CLI, it will pick up the, the region name and it will work with that region. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's that simple. Sure. Uh, so Maybe the mic, use the mic, uh, Andre. I can bring the mic. <laughs> it's far away from you, sorry. So if you look at the Mistral help, you will find that several, uh, several parameters starting with tar target uh, underscore or OS, OS target underscore. These are the parameters you have to fill in, and then Mistral is going to uh, target the cloud you you want to use. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so thank you all for coming. Yeah. Thanks. We'll be here if you have any questions. <laughs>